Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Happy Hour Show with Nancy Reed and Lisa Smith, the crazy mother-daughter travel team and publishers of Big Blend Radio and TV Magazine. You can check that out at BlendRadioandTV.com. And on today's show, we have best-selling author Mark Forsyth joining us to share some of the fun insights from his new book, A Short History of Drunkenness. I love it. I know. (laughs) To me, it's the history of humans. (laughs) But anyway, uh, we're going to hear how to make a hanger martini with mixologist Heather Witherington over at the historic Yuma Landing Bar and Grill, which is historically, uh, this is the site where the very first airplane landed um, in the state of Arizona, and they wanted cocktails, I think. That's that's what happened. That's why they landed. That's why they landed. <laughs> of course, we have happy hour-themed music, and we've got a great announcement for a Craven Raven cocktail-making contest. Uh, lots of good prizes, all inspired from our last happy hour show with the Craven rock band out of Florida. So stay tuned for that. But I think it's time to bring our special guest on the show, an internationally best-selling author of the Etymologicon. Do you oh, say that you 10 did. times on a happy <laughs> hour show? I'm not even saying it right. Am I, Mark? Am I it sounds, it right? that, was, that was pretty good. Etymological. Yeah. Etymological. I, I had it yeah. earlier. Yeah, I think I need a drink. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then. Yes, it you've flows got your, more easily off the tongue. Yeah, and then uh, let's talk about your TED Talk. What's a snolly goster? Yes. So these are good words for a happy hour show. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Snolly Goster is a dishonest politician. It's one of the most useful little words hidden away in the Oxford English Dictionary that nobody uses anymore. Presumably because all politicians these days are honest. That's my theory. I, I don't even start what? me on politicians. <laughs> but, but the dictionary thing, that's, that's a big thing for you. How did you go from, you know, words and dictionaries to the history of drunkenness? I mean, because your book is the short history of drunkenness. How, why, where, and when humankind has gotten merry from the Stone Age to the present. And uh, I love this book. It's one of those you're going to pick up and keep reading different stories and go, like, I didn't know, you know, goddesses had, you know, drinking contests. <laughs> but everybody's out now. And you can also follow Mark on his blog. Go to inkyfool.com. And uh, it's in bookstores across the country right now. And you can go on Amazon. I think that bars should open up bookstores so we can have books like this in the bar. Because it's good trivia, and uh, so I think that that's our next thing here. But yeah, Mark, welcome. And how did you go from dictionaries to drunk history? <laughs> well, I think well, weirdly enough, it is kind of deep down the same thing. A dictionaries. I always found a fascinating thing about language. We, we use the English language all the time, but we never stop and think about the words we're using. When you do, they suddenly all start sounding a bit weird. And but there's always a story behind them, where they come from. You know, you just have a simple word like you know, fan, a thing, a football fan or a fan of this thing or whatever you think oh wait where did the word fan come from any it turns out it's short for fanatic it's just a shortening and so you're a fanatic for football you're a fanatic for that thing and you go oh wow something which was very familiar and you suddenly made strange and you see it in a new light and I sort of want to do the same thing for drinking because Mm -hmm. drinking is something we all do and we all think we kind of know it but then if you stop and think about it and say wait what is getting drunk and why are we doing this and has it always been the same way if I were in ancient Egypt and I wanted to get drunk would it have been the same thing or in ancient Greece or in the wild west what was that actually like and what what, what on earth are we doing and so I wanted to look at that so I decided to write this book where roughly speaking you drop in at different places and times Mm -hmm. and you say Okay, you're in ancient Greece, classical Athens, and you you want to get absolutely sloshed. Um, how do you go about it? What what time of day do you do it? Who's there? Are women invited? I you know how fast do you drink? What are you drinking? And the same thing if you were in um, you know the Wild West. What was a Wild West saloon actually like? Or the gin craze in the early 18th century London, or a medieval tavern, which we've all sort of seen in you know Robin Hood films. But what was it actually like in there? And how did you go about getting drunk? And so that's what I set out to do. Oh, I love it because Nancy and I lived in a few different countries. And, you know, you you go into, you know, the different tribes in Kenya. And that's where we used to live. And so when you started talking about gin and the history of gin Mm -hmm. and gin shops, I was like, I didn't even know they had gin shops. 
But gin was such a big deal, and not just in Kenya, but also when we lived in South Africa. It was gin, gin, gin yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why gin? What's wrong with cane and coke that we used to get in South Africa? But gin was a big deal. So it was really... Sundowners. Yeah, you guys brought it over to Africa. <laughs> yeah, and we 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 brought it over from, from Holland. Yeah, the phrase Dutch courage, oh. that comes from the fact that Dutch soldiers, um, we, we noticed at the beginning of the 18th century, we were in a war with them. Well, we were on the same side as them, so they were our allies. And we noticed that they drank this strange new drink called gin, got themselves absolutely sloshed, and then charged bravely into battle. And that was the, yeah, they got the courage out of a bottle, and so we called it Dutch courage. And it became the cool, exotic thing that our allies drank. And so we, we the British, brought it back to, to London and um, uh, started the first massive, essentially, drugs panic of the uh, Western world as everybody in London started drinking gin and drinking way too much of it. Wow. It's amazing. And then you talk about the Wild West Saloon. Um, up in, in Nevada, the state of Nevada, we went to a little town called Yarrington. And they have Mason Valley, Smith Valley, it's kind of like this region uh, just south of Reno near Carson City. And um, at this place, it's actually on the Pony Express Trail, the California Trail, where everybody crossed over, but this is tiny town, has the oldest family-operated casino in the state, so before Las Vegas became Las Vegas. But while we wow. were in the museum, they have this display, and it's called Pies and Switch. This town had three different names. The last one was Yarrington because they were going to get this railroad dude to come in and bring the railroad and his money. Um, I don't think that happened, but at one time it was called Pies and Switch. And Pies and Switch came from poison, the word poison, because they had this saloon out in the middle of nowhere and travelers would go through and you, they would switch out the real booze for this, this poison nasty stuff. And you were talking about that in the Wild West that half the time you weren't really getting like you know you weren't getting the real whiskey it was absolutely awful awful stuff um yeah the thing about the wild west is everyone was well nominally at least drinking whiskey because you had to transport your barrels there for hundreds thousands of miles over land and so obviously transporting a barrel of beer is only going to get you drunk you know a couple of times whereas if you transport a barrel of whiskey then that will um give you just much more alcohol much more bang for your buck and so uh, everyone is drinking whiskey, but actual proper whiskey is very hard to come by. Uh, so uh, the, there were much cheaper remedies. I can actually just, I can, uh, recipes to make fake whiskey. And I can find one for you in the book here, just a second. It's in my hand, if I can get to it quickly. Uh, That's just rude, I have to just say. Yeah. It's just the Pison part of it, which I find fascinating that we've been to a place where they have, here's a museum with a Pison switch. Here's mm -hmm. the, they've got all the old casino machines and then go around the corner and here's, you know. It, it did have names. So people, it got nicknamed things like coffin varnish, tarantula juice, tanglefoot and sheep dip. But I, here I can, I can quote you, this is from an original 19th century book on how to make stuff which the most critical examination will scarcely detect, apparently. So um, here's the, their recipe for old rye. This is a real recipe for the use of saloon keepers in the Wild West. Neutral spirit, four gallons. Alcoholic solution of starch, one gallon. Decoction of tea, one pint. Infusion of almonds, one pint. Color with one ounce of the tincture of cochineal and of burnt sugar, four ounces. Flavor with oil of wintergreen, three drops, oh. dissolved in one ounce of alcohol. And that's, that's, what your rye whiskey was. Wow. Scotch whiskey contained creosote. Oh, nice. I mean, this, creosote. Yeah, this, this stuff could really poison you and kill you, and people did actually die. <laughs> nice. How nice is this? And then go over to Kentucky, because mm. I find this cool. We're, we're about to go actually visit the Bourbon Trail in Kentucky. So the word cocktail comes from there, pretty much? The, the, uh, the pretty much it comes from the West, which exact state it comes from. Is, is hard to say, but it was a, a similar thing, which is a Kentucky breakfast was a um, uh, two chews of tobacco and a, and a whiskey. And the thing is, if you're going to drink like that, then you probably need something. If you're drinking that kind of whiskey, you probably need something to um, uh, dilute it with. And so uh, what you uh, did was you just added fruit juice and that took the terrible taste away, but still got you drunk. 
And this is also the reason that cocktails were so big in prohibition in America, because though in prohibition, you know, they're gangsters making all that bathtub gin and, and uh, distributing it. But bathtub gin just tasted awful, absolutely terrible, which is why you had to drown it in everything else. Wow. No. So this is like the spices, you know, of, of bad meat. Well, yeah. We have this thing where we don't want to go through life sober. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> we're going through all these lengths and it's really somehow we need to get a buzz. But you, you even talk about animals and then like, you know, pre-man times that we were getting a buzz back in the day, like way, way back in the day. Oh, and yeah. All, all of the higher apes love drinking if they can just get their hands on it. The problem is for them is that they can't manufacture it. So, I mean, there's a one little, there's a little island off Costa Rica. I've always wanted to visit it ever since I've learned about it, where basically alcohol just occurs naturally in rotting fruit. Leaf fruit to rot, it, it, it produces alcohol. And there's this particular fruit on this particular island, which therefore um, makes lots of alcohol. And howler, mantled howler monkeys who live there just eat this fruit all day, every day. And they're consuming roughly the equivalent adjusted for body weight of about three bottles of wine an hour. And wow. they just, they just, they just lie around in the forest canopy, utterly sloshed, and occasionally they fall out and die. I mean, <laughs> oh, that's no. well. When we lived in Kenya, yeah. wasn't there that one elephant, or like there was a season the, where the was it the marula tree or the marula tree? I got my wrong country. country. Like, no, no, the marula um, tree. They have like they look like um, kumquats, little tiny oranges, and they drop to the floor, and. Um, and then they, it would just kind of ferment, and the warthogs and the elephants, even giraffes, would like they knew they knew, and they would they all ate it, and they all got drunk. Yeah, the, the annual annual booze up. Yeah, of the animals. There was a there was a terrible case in India in the mid 1980s where the um a herd of elephants managed because elephants love alcohol. And they managed to break into a distillery, an illegal distillery it was, and um, they drank it dry. And it's 150 elephants, roughly speaking. And they all got drunk and they all got violent and they went on a rampage and they, they ripped down um, uh, a couple of villages. They actually, I mean, if you, if you imagine trying to deal with one drunk, violent elephant, that's quite enough for me. But now multiply that by 150 and imagine the chaos. And a bunch of people got killed. It was a, it was a terrible thing. But they can smell. You know, yeah. They can smell alcohol. And they're like, okay, I'm going I'm to go get some. I know, I know. <laughs> I want to talk about that there's, there's goddesses. Okay, so is it Enki and Inanna that um, had a drinking contest? I'm like, is this the first round of quarters? I don't know if you played quarters in England, but in... It's a college. Yeah, uh, we don't have that phrase in England, no. But I mean, it's the first, yeah, the, the beer pong, whatever you want to call it. There are a thousand and one drinking games. And yeah, Enki and Inanna had a drinking contest. And that, I mean, that's uh, at, at the dawn of writing. So that's, yeah, people were having drinking contests for as long as there's been written history. We've known about that. Um, and yeah, there have been a bunch of goddesses of uh of wine and beer and uh, stuff. There was Ninkazi, she was the goddess, the Sumerian goddess of beer. And there, there was Hathor, who was the ancient Egyptian beer goddess, because the, the story ran that she'd been on a mission to kill all of mankind. And um, she was, her blood was up and she wouldn't stop. And so the chief god in order to save mankind um, had a huge amount of beer made, red beer, and he had it poured out all over the fields. And um, she thought it was human blood, and she drank it, and um, got very, very sleepy, and um, went to sleep, and forgot all about killing mankind. And wow. so their big festival of drinking was based around Hathor and the beer, and the moment the beer saved all humanity. So now, That's funny. Okay, beer was the first thing, and 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 this is going back to the the ages of why we actually farm is because of our love of booze, that we needed to make booze. And so that's how it started. It wasn't about food. It was about drinking. Yes, there's a very good uh, argument for that. I, 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 uh, the historians are divided on this, although most of the arguments point towards the idea when we gave up hunter-gathering and switched to farming, was it in order to um, make beer or to make bread? And the answer is probably beer, because if it was just bread, then we would have died of vitamin B deficiency because you can get vitamin B out of hunting and gathering because it's in other animals. And you can get vitamin B out of beer, but there is no vitamin B in bread. 
So um, it seems that we went straight onto the um, beer, and that's why we settled down for agriculture. And it seems a much better reason for, to me than bread. And either way, to that point, there's more energy in beer than bread. If you've got a pile of barley and you want to get the most energy out of it, don't turn it into bread. Turn it into beer. Liquid bread, way better for you. That sounds like a plan to me, except for the beer back then. It sounds pretty disgusting. It, like even when I was reading, yeah, all these descriptions, and it's thick and like it's uh, that's I I I'll hurl like <laughs> that, that's, that's yeah, like it's a little bit more like porridge than it is mm -hmm. like the beer we know today. But I mean, they, there were ways around that. So if you were in uh, the ancient city of Ur in sort of 2000 BC, that's where Abraham is meant to uh, come out of, then uh, we know how they, that they drank beer through straws. What you did if you went to a bar in Ur, and there were bars just like in a, a modern city, um, and each bar contained its own little microbrewery, they were making the beer on site, all very craft ale. You would order a big kind of cauldron of beer for you and your friends. And then you'd always get all get a straw, which was made out of a reed. And then so long straws, which everyone puts into the cauldron. So you are, can suck the beer up from the bottom because all the stuff in it would rise to the, all the sediment would rise to the top. So you could suck out pretty much pure beer through your straw and everyone would sit around the cauldron. Man, that is a way to get hammered too. I mean, it's just, wow. it's kind of like when, when you're going through this book, that's why it, this is, to me, I know it's the history of, okay, us all having booze in different ways and, and goddesses and deities into it and the whole, like the Koran's got, you know, paradise, you know, rivers of wine, which I'm like, that would yeah. think that with the Koran. Um, but when you start to really read this, I'm going, this is actually like the history of, of humans, of, of mankind in a way. And it seems to be that that is one thing that we... We should just all stop fighting and just have a drink together because apparently that's where we all connect quite well. <laughs> we absolutely should. Yeah, I mean, almost every, pretty much every culture in, in the world has had booze. And if they haven't, they've had some other way to get high. Mankind basically can't bear very much reality. And uh, yeah, it'd be lovely if we could all settle down and have a drink together. The question is whether we would all be peaceable because... Yeah. Uh, uh, it changes mm. from culture to culture. Some cultures have, have uh, violent drinking cultures. And some cultures, like the Egyptians, have very peaceful dr drinking cultures. The Egyptians drank and they associated drink with, well, sex and um, going to sleep and having a good time. Whereas the Vikings, for example, being Vikings, you know how they were, um, uh, beer was something you drank and then you started fights and everything got crazy. And a Viking mead hall would be all very nice until somebody chopped your head off, basically. Um, there's, a, there's a lovely bit, uh, it's sort of all you need to know about getting drunk in the Viking mead hall is in the poem Beowulf, which is about this Viking hero. And he's wonderful and, uh, spoiler alert, I'm afraid he dies at the end and uh, all his friends mourn him. And they look back on how he was such a one-off, how we shall not see his like again. There was never any guy like this. He was such a great guy. And this is the highest praise I can give to him. He's, he was such a great guy. He never killed any of his friends while he was drunk. <laughs> that great. Oh gosh, that just shows how and we... So like, how... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that shows how crazy violent it was. Do you think that the difference between the, the cultures there would be the amount consumed or the kind of booze? Like it's largely Go ahead. It's largely to do, and this is, I know, very counterintuitive, but it's largely to do with your culture. Almost everything that happens to you when you drink is culturally defined. If you come from a culture that says, when you get drunk, you'll get into a fight, then you'll get drunk and you'll get into a fight. If you come from a culture that says when you get drunk, you'll um, fall in love and sing songs, then you'll fall in love and sing songs. If you get there are lots of cultures where they have religious drink, where mm. you, um, you drink until you can communicate with the ancestral spirits. Mm. Um, and because they have that cultural background, they're drinking alcohol. It's the same active ingredient every time. They're drinking alcohol and get to the point where they have their vision of their ancestral spirits. I mean, per personally, for me, if I were you know, had a few gin and tonics and then saw my grandmother, um, Lord rest her soul, I would, I would be pretty damn frightened and surprised. But um, there are cultures mm. where that would be completely natural. And there's even an odder little aspect of it, which is if you drink a, uh, a drink which you associate with another culture and another way of 
being, then you'll react like that. So in Britain, for example, where there's quite a big drinking fighting culture, people mm-hmm. do get violent on beer in general. But if you give a British guy wine, which we associate with France and sophistication and all that sort of stuff, people don't get violent after they've drunk wine. And that this is why, yeah, nobody ever has too many um, fruit cocktails and then gets into a fight. You, you get into a fight on particular kinds of drinks, which you associate with that action. Like tequila is supposed to be like that. Yeah, tequila you, to kill you. Um, yeah. With a friend of tequila to kill you, but tequila is always it's always the same active ingredient, which is alcohol. There's just one simple chemical in there, and it's dressed up in a lot of ways. But there's no I'm real sorry. difference between drinks like that. I, I'd yeah. like I'd like to have some tequila now. <laughs> tequila is good. We, we lived in Mexico, and I remember my dentist going, "Okay, you're here, and this is this is the kind you need to have," and blah blah blah. And he actually tracked us down in the middle of the city of Ensenada to give us the right bottle of tequila. The next time we saw him, he gave us rum from when he went to Cuba, and it, he was he was a great dentist. But yeah. he he was so funny. He goes, "Yeah, one one tequila, you smile. Second one, you dance." The third one, you fall down. And it's <laughs> that, true. That, that was the rule of tequila in Mexico. But this is so fascinating for you going through this and getting all the history. I mean, did you feel like, you know, doing you're doing the chart of the world? I mean, how long did it take? And it did you find like just all these discoveries? It must have been so much fun to put this together. It was. It was great researching it. Although, I mean, it's an odd thing I've had. Every time I told people I'm writing a history of drunkenness, they, they would say, oh, the research must be fun. As though I was just down the pub drinking. And, and whereas, in fact, I was in the British Library, I'm afraid, um, mm. sitting there reading through scholarly, learned books about, you know, the ancient festival of drunkenness or whatever it happened to be. Um, but it, it was wonderful turning up these strange stories. And some that sometimes... A drinking world is so familiar, and you almost think, "Wow, yeah, I would." If you transported me four thousand years back in time to ancient Mesopotamia, I would, I would know how to, you know, work this out. This it looks very uh, similar and very much like I do things. And other times you go, "Wow, that's weird and unpleasant," and I'm very glad I, <laughs> I, I never lived there. And um, so it would. And of course, there are so many lovely stories of the funny things people have done when they're drunk. Um, oh, the, and you know, what about Jesus making water into wine? I mean, yeah. Go Jesus. I mean, <laughs> three like things. Like each, each. each um, well, uh, there are three barrels, each containing twenty to thirty gallons. It's a lot of wine. I've always thought it must have been absolutely fantastic quality. Yeah. I mean, this is Messiah quality wine. That's that's got to be the greatest vintage uh, ever. It's very hard to say. I mean, in a in a general sense, it uh, reflects the um, Judeo-Christian heritage, which is that our wine in the Bible is generally speaking just considered a kind of a, a good thing. Um, everyone's kind of happy with it most of the time. Uh, you know, the occasional uh, little prescriptions against getting too drunk, but mainly it's good and. Uh, Jesus sat down with the publicans and the sinners, and in Matthew chapter 12, I think it is, he points out that everyone says he's a big drinker, and so maybe he was, I, I, I don't know. And, and obviously there's the communion in, in Christianity, or, mm-hmm. uh, our tiny little leftover bit of holy drinking, but we aren't meant to get drunk on that. Uh, but uh, why, in, in terms of the, um, uh, John's gospel there, and the, the wedding at Cana, is it meant to be an allegory of something or is it just meant to be literally Jesus wanted everyone to have a good time? It's, it's very hard to say if there is a, a deeper meaning to that other than the fact that, well, people wanted wine and Jesus seems to have been a very good party guest. Well, and at the same time you talk about, in, in the book you talk about going back in the dark ages with the monks because they're known, I mean, uh, the Captain Trappist beer, trapeze, oh. however everyone wants to say it a different way, like they're they're known for beer and they're known for wine here in the southwest where we are in the states uh, we're out in tucson here we have all these missions and then of course the, it's, it's similar to monasteries and as the, as the missions came through and, and were built like with father, father kino and it goes all the way up california uh, and of course texas has it too where here's all these missions but this is where wine came in uh was through there but then there were some uh importations coming in from Italy and things like that. I know that that happened. 
but this it's so fascinating the history of wine and how you say is um, in the Benedict rules that they say it's okay to have a little wine. So they're not saying no. It's more, more than a little. Um, the Benedictine <laughs> rules allow uh, allow you the, a ration. You get you as a monk, you have a right to one bottle of wine a day, basically, wow. as a Benedictine monk in middle, middle ages. Um, this is because, I mean, well, there are two things. Just to go back to what, what you were saying about uh, the, uh, the vineyards coming in with the missionaries, that's because um, the last supper, uh, a huge change to world flora and fauna it had was that everywhere the missionaries went, they had to take some kind of vine or wine order so that you could have Holy Communion with the wine. So monks actually had to take with them little vines on, on the ships when they arrived to convert the new world. And anywhere you're trying to convert, you've got to get wine there, which actually made it really hard to convert places like Iceland, where <laughs> you can't grow wine and to import it takes an, an awfully long time. But in terms of like, why did medieval people drink all the time? Medieval people did drink all the time, huge amounts per day. And the reason is that water was bad. The water was awful. It was filled with bacteria and all sorts of nasty runoff, and there was no modern sewage system. And water, water could kill you. Um, I mean, just imagine if you had to, um, from where you are right now, think of where's the nearest source of fresh water, the nearest river or stream or whatever, and would you like to drink out of it? And 99% chance that you, your listeners, will go no. I mean, some of you may live high up in beautiful mountain pastures with a clear stream floating going past but for almost everybody no and also water has no nutritional value whereas i say beer does so in medieval times you just didn't drink water and you didn't drink tea or coffee they didn't exist and there wasn't i mean fruit juice was around but very expensive um, milk was almost always made into cheese because there's no refrigeration if you're going to drink anything it's going to be beer or alcohol in some form because the thing about alcohol is it, it's a natural disinfectant so the um uh the, the process uh disinfects everything and makes it safe to drink so uh children drank beer uh women drank beer men drank beer we drank it at breakfast we drank it at lunch and we drank it at dinner there was no time when you would drink water but the thing is so a bottle of wine a day sounds a lot but it actually and i've tried this myself if you start at dawn and then do have an active day doing work outside and just drinking a little bit all day you don't actually get that drunk mm -hmm. you can drink um some i mean uh, in uh, uh, so uh, monks in italy would usually have a ration of wine monks in britain in england would have a, a ration of beer they'd have a gallon of beer a day that's eight pints so wow. eight large beers a day but that's if you spread that out over a 16 hour day that's just a pint every two hours that's not falling over drunk that's at all that's just, man you're gonna go pee pee a lot kind of sorry but. you're you're gonna go pee pee a lot absolutely and i i i, 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 say, I tested this out i got a gallon of beer eight pints i was staying up with my parents and i helped them out with some gardening and um i i uh, started the eight pack in the morning finished it in the at, at the end of the day before going to bed i wasn't drunk well, next time you do that kind of yeah. test, just call us. But yeah, we'll, we'll help you there. <laughs> when we okay, I shall. Kenya, when, when we lived in Kenya, um, the water, I mean, it was really difficult to get decent water. I'm talking several years ago. I'm sure they have running tap water now. But <laughs> at the time when we were there, you know, unless you lived right in the middle of Nairobi or something, you didn't have running tap water. Mm. So um, it was... We we drank alcohol. Lots of people drank lots of alcohol. In fact, rum was cheaper than Coca Cola. And gin and tonic <laughs> because the tonic had quinine in it. Yeah. And because and, of the mosquitoes. Oh yeah. And that was our excuse for that too. I know. <laughs> you don't need an excuse. If there's one thing that my the, my research of this history taught me, you really don't need an excuse to drink. People have been looking for excuses and finding them for 5,000 years of recorded history, but you don't really need it. Just, just drink. Everyone else Well, does. Americans, we were a very puritanical yeah. society at the beginning, but then you made me think about, okay, in, you talk about Plymouth Rock, mm -hmm. that the, May, the Mayflower had to stop for beer. <laughs> yeah, they, they, the Mayflower was not meant to stop at Plymouth Rock. They had orders to continue down the coast, but they had run out of beer. So what, what are you going to do? Because even Puritans, they, 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 were, they were beer drinkers. 
And oddly enough, when they first arrived in, in America, the, the stream water and the river water was pretty good because it's very sparsely populated. So you could have drunk the river water, but they're like water. Who drinks water? And wow. I looked up famous drunk people. And I could, you know, yes. um, going back to the Egyptians, apparently Cleopatra was always drunk. And, you know, I've always heard and seen on television, oh, she took her, she bathed in milk. Well, now I see that she actually was bathing in wine and she drank all the time and they called her the queen of drunkenness. <laughs> Wow. I mean, some, some people have, uh, some cultures have, uh, I mean, so there are times when I'd be reading about uh, some ancient culture and they're, they're sort of adding it up and thinking, I've, I've got a pretty good he head for alcohol. I, I like a drink. And, but I'm, I was looking and thinking, I couldn't do that. I would be, I would be dead in hospital, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. long before I got to that point. But then again, I'm used to the sort of Western style of drinking, start in the evening, maybe, and I would drink at lunch. But without the, uh, the spreading it out over the day. Yeah. And I also read that the second man to step foot on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, deserved his first name. Apparently he was drunk and he weed in his spacesuit. Really? Yep, we're back to the pee, -pee again. Really? Yeah. I did. Right? In his spacesuit. Wow. Because I, 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 I... Neil Armstrong could have been drunk too because his quote that it, you know, small, a small step for mankind and a giant leap for man or something makes no sense. <laughs> whatsoever so now i read that they were both drunk that's cool <laughs> i know that NASA, nasa has officially admitted that on at least two shuttle launches which wouldn't be the original um moon mission but on two shuttle launches the astronauts have been full-on drunk that is awesome and you would think there would be no alcohol i would be drinking if i went up to space Definitely. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to fire me at several times the speed of sound towards an endless void, I'm going to need a drink beforehand. Absolutely. So, yeah. are you going to write about the history of humans and pot? I mean, it's it, right now. With you know, this country is like, should we have weed? Should we not? Um, do you think that you would do something like that? The history of drugs or pot or? Um, I don't think so because I, I kept having to read up or the, obviously the two histories are very close history of alcohol and history of um, drugs the the history books on drugs tend to be filled with conspiracy theories that we were all oh they they, they, they get oh, a bit wow. crazy they're, they're all oh we were happily uh, every uh, the ancient greeks were all smoking pot or whatever it happens to be um it's just they never wrote it down ever, which seems incredibly unlikely. There are cultures who've had pot, they, um, the, the Scythians, the ancient people, nomads who wandered the plains of the, the Russian steppe. They were definitely smoking pot. Um, they were kind of hotboxing it in their tent, and you can, you can still find their equipment is in museums. But um, generally, it's, it's a lot harder to find reliable sources, or and uh, there's a lot more stuff made up. <laughs> yeah. I always wondered if when the Native Americans and they're smoking the peace pipe, if they were really getting high. Uh, most people seem to agree that that was tobacco. Some people yeah. theorize it was pot. I'm not, I, 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 I'm not the expert enough to differentiate, really, and I'm not much of a pot man. I mean, the one place that alcohol took second place, it's largely been um, uh, Central and Latin America, where they were always kind of, or usually they were more fond of hallucinogens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, and people still go there. But they, 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 they did have, stuff, you know. they did have, the Incas did have um, alcoholic chocolate drinks, which sounds fun. That's, that sounds like a good time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm into that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah George bring that Washington, back. George Washington, you talk about him, and this is very fascinating because I mean, he was, he, he was just, he's so interesting to me. And yet he was into making whiskey and serving it and helping, helping his troops with it, with, with booze and his voters. And he was also one of the first people to grow hemp in this country. So I'm just saying, yeah. he, he was a happy yeah. dude. I, don't know, I think he was trying to- control. George Washington owned the largest distillery in the United States of America. He was absolutely massive producer. 11,000 gallons of whiskey a year. Wow, wow, this is amazing. I think it's a form of control. Yeah, it, I find the history of it so fascinating. We can't wait to get up to um, Kentucky this year because 
there's a gentleman out there, he, his bourbon archaeology is what he does, and he goes in and digs up all the old distilleries, whether they were moonshiners or actual distilleries, and he's, he's saving the history of bourbon in Kentucky, one dig at a time. <laughs> it's awesome. Wow. I think it's, it's fascinating. But I want to ask you, Mark, um, happy hour, since you've been having some experiences other than the library. <laughs> if you <laughs> yeah. spent happy hour with anyone in the world, alive or passed on, who would it be? Where would you spend happy hour? What are you going to drink? And what is the discussion about? I think, I mean, obviously, if this was a real choice, then I'd take one of those people you want to know about, it be Jesus or Shakespeare or something like that. But I think I'd choose um, Geoffrey Chaucer. He's a guy that I've always, always just really liked. I, mean, I read uh, Canterbury Tales. I feel I know the guy. He, he's a friendly guy. He's my kind of guy. And I would enjoy spending uh, a, an hour with him in a tavern in London. He'd probably object to an alehouse because alehouses were the lowest of the low taverns sold wine. So I'll, I'll take him out for a nice slap up hour in a tavern in uh, medieval London. Unless, of course, I could take him somewhere really weird like Hong Kong <laughs> and <laughs> full speed him, <laughs> full speed him cocktail. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think a nice, a pleasant hour by the Thames with Jeffrey Chaucer. And and was it good, is it going to be beer? Like, you know, or? Uh, I think it'd be, it'd be wine. Um, wine, possibly yeah. sherry, which would be about the, oh, yeah. the most expensive thing on the menu. Because, I mean, the odd thing, medieval world spirits exist. So your choice is beer, wine, maybe cider, and then the top form of wine is the slightly stronger fortified wine that's um, flavored that's um, sherry. So um, he'd appreciate the sherry. Um, we, haven't had, we haven't had <laughs> sherry since we were in England and in South Africa. And I remember people having like oh, sherry gosh. time like at three in the afternoon. Some had tea, some had mm -hmm. sherry. Remember that? It was yeah. like the little glass yeah. of brown sherry. sherry. Oh, that's a, that bad. There's that a weird good. thing that sherry is always sort of not quite counted as alcohol, even though it's stronger than wine. I remember my years ago, my grandmother coming down to stay, and she arrived, and my father offers a drink, and she said, "Oh, I'm on these uh, I, I, these pills. I'm not meant to drink for, for a week, so um, I'll, I, I won't have any alcohol. Just sherry, please." Oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> That's so funny. I thought you know, England was a really interesting thing for alcohol, you know. Mm -hmm. I, and and then when we got back to the states, it was like, okay, it's totally different. In England, I mean, there's just the ciders and mm -hmm. the slow gin. When we were in the Channel Islands in Guernsey, they they made this homemade slow gin stuff. And I remember I love slow it. gin. I remember stumbling around a little bit after yeah. that, and because it, it was some yeah, because it tastes it like, like fruit juice. So you think I can knock this back by the point, but it is just gin. <laughs> no it, kidding. It sneaks up on you. I know. Yeah. So thank, thank you so much for joining us. I'm uh, very excited. This is everybody's got to get this book, and uh, I yes. think this is make a good book club conversation with Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 go yeah, ahead, I just want to ask you one quick thing. Have you ever seen the show on television? I don't know if you have it over there. Drunken History. Drunk History. Drunk History. Oh, uh, yeah, I've seen it on YouTube. Yeah, great fun. Yes. It, that is fun. I know that it's yeah. I think the whole history of of drinking is fun, and then people telling history while drunk. That is that is That's fun true. too. I know. <laughs> uh, but everybody again. The book is a short history of drunkenness. How, why, where, and when humankind has gotten merry from the Stone Age to the present. Again, it's by Mark Forsythe. You can get it in bookstores across the country. Go to Amazon, all those great online stores. And also keep up with Mark on his blog, inkyfool.com. And uh, just in a few seconds, we will be uh, sharing our cocktail contest with the Craven, the Craven Band out of Florida, making their Craven Raven cocktail because that's what happened during our happy hour chat with them. We're like, you need a cocktail. Um, so stay tuned for that because three of the prizes are this, as this book because it's perfect. It's, it's perfect. a perfect book. So you got to stay tuned to see how you can win that. Uh, Mark, is there any history of ravens in drinking? <laughs> I just had to ask as we were saying. This. History of ravens in drinking? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I I can't think. I mean, ravens almost certainly uh, like a drink because lots of intelligent birds do. But I can't. I 
can't okay. think of any offhand. They like I'm shiny tired. glasses, though. That's the thing. You got to make something shiny with your glass or do something sparkly so they can steal it. That's what they <laughs> crows and ravens. Um, everybody, yeah. uh, we're gonna, we've got a good song for you. And we're going to play Mark. We like to play music for people. Uh, this is called Whiskey, Go Figure. And uh, it's Johnny Mastro and the Mama's Boys out of New Orleans. And that's uh, off of their album, Never Trust the Living. <laughs> uh, whiskey, she's on the whiskey. And then right after that, you're going to hear Heather Witherington uh, share some of the aviation history at the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill in Yuma, Arizona. And uh, their aviation-inspired cocktails, like the Hangar Martini, which I totally enjoyed, as you will hear during that conversation. Thanks so much for joining us, Mark. Thank you very much for having me on the show. It's hey, been fun. Take care and cheers. Yeah. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> This is Lisa with Big Blend Radio, and I'm sitting at the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill in Yuma, Arizona. It is connected to the Coronado Motor Hotel, a very historic hotel here. And also, it's just a few steps down from the Colorado River and the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area. And I tell you what, this is a fun place to come and have some cocktails. And I'm sitting with Heather Witherington, who is a mixologist here. 
Man, you mix up some good stuff here. Well, thank you. Yes, especially this. This has now become... I'm not a huge martini drinker, but now I am. I'm not leaving here until this is finished. Um, this is the hanger martini. Bottomless? Bottomless. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite lovely. Um, yes, I like bottomless drinks. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the hanger martini. What inspired you to make this? Uh, well, signature drink. We needed something that represents aviation history. Uh, represents our bar, which we are called the Hanger. So what better than to use Hanger One Vodka and use it as a martini? And this was the place where the very first airplane landed yes, in the state of Arizona. October 25th, 1911. Wow. And think about it, what airplanes back then, those were not the same as what we have now. Not at all. Mm -mm. This was like, it, I think it was modeled after a Wright plane? A Wright, uh, Brothers, a Wright plane? Brothers plane, yes. Wow. The, the Model B biplane. Wow. So now we're in the hangar. So that's the thing. The Yuma Landing has like three entities. There's the Captain's Lounge, yes. the Hangar Sports Bar. And then our dining area. This is the Shenanigan Bar. This is a Shenanigan. And then the restaurant area. So it's really good because the hotel guests get to have dinner and breakfast in the morning. Um, but then you get to play and then stumble to your room. Yeah, well, sure. never done that. Not never. Never, not never. Once. But not this, once. this is really a wonderful, wonderful martini. Oh, thank Seriously. You. Now the Hangar Vodka is interesting. The Hanger Vodka is actually brewed in Alameda, California, and it's handcrafted. It's handcrafted? Handcrafted. Wow. Isn't that in Alameda? That's Alameda up in, uh, by Oakland. Yes. In, like up in Northern California. Yes. This is actually made in a an old World War II hangar. A World War II hangar? Yes. So that's like a perfect fit. It is. I think they should come and distill it in here, though. Just, just saying it'd be fun. I don't know how much would get distilled. I don't know. I don't know if we want it to be distilled. Well, you know what? When you drink artisan vodka, actually, I know that we like to party here, but we interview a lot of health professionals, and yes. I've learned that vodka, especially artisan vodka, is the cleanest alcohol to drink. It is the cleanest and best for your body because of the distilling process. I did not know that. So I feel like I really need to just sit and finish this here. You I'm know? sure you will. So you've got the hangar, and it's interesting because it's in Alameda, which that was helped. That was founded because of Juan Batista de Anza. Um, he is him and Father Font back in 1776. They did an expedition in Mexico, south of Tucson. They were it's about 600, 700 miles. Went up, wow. horseback and on foot. And this whole expedition. Now there's a National Historic Trail, the Juan Batista de Anza I've National heard of Historic it. Trail. And this was his second expedition. He first went all the way up to check out. Okay, we're going to bring all these people up. And the second time, he had all women, children, donkeys, you name it. No one died on this trail. That's outstanding. They came and they crossed over the Yuma Crossing, where, you know, this is where everybody crossed. Because, it, well, one of the places, Lee's Ferry, I think it is, is the other place where people crossed mm -hmm. over the Colorado River. But this is the very first one, and they founded the city of San Francisco at the Presidio there. And so that's how San Francisco was made wow. in 1776. By the end of the expedition, buff. I am. And <laughs> I love history. But no, the expedition going up there, that was at the same time as our country was being founded on the East Coast, which is kind of trippy how historic this is. This and, is intertwined and They came all through Yuma, went up there, but you would never have this vodka without Juan Batista Day. <laughs> well, <laughs> There's thank my you, big Batista. connection, you know, <laughs> hey. But it's cool. There's a nice connection, and that's how everybody went up into the gold rush areas and everything like that. So. I like that, that nice connection of vodka and San Francisco and Yuma put together. There we go. Hey, it's <laughs> cool. It works for me, man. So you've got, tell me a little bit more. So you've got the vodka. Now you shake this, right? Yes, you put it in a, in a shaker over ice. Um, it's just a Hanger One vodka, a little splash of olive juice, and a little splash of dry vermouth. So it's a dirty... A, a dirty hanger. Yeah. Well, you know, that happens. That happens, yeah. Well, of course, you know, with this being, you know, there's a lot of aviation history in Yuma. There's a tons. I yes. I mean, Amelia Earhart came through here. There's that one air journey that they did with that one plane where they flew nonstop. And uh, for 49... Out, oh, I'm going to get it all messed up. But anyone, everyone, if, if you go to the city of Yuma office, you can actually see the airplane where they just did this nonstop flying, and they were putting gasoline in the airplane. The guy standing in a car, and yes, flying, you know what I'm talking yes, about. Yes, I do. I don't know if it was 49 days or 49 hours, but I think it was days. I want to say days. It's days. It is days. Yeah. So I know, I know that history, but it went out of my head because I'm drinking a hanger martini. <laughs> so if you want to forget anything, come here. <laughs> yeah, just come here and have a good time. But now you've got other cocktails here and food, all inspired by aviation. The AV Fuel Margarita. Yes. Tell us about that. 
Um, again, a very simple. It is done in a shaker, and uh, it is just Grand Marnier, Patron, and sweet and sour. Sweet and sour. Oh, you got to have that in your margarita. Uh, of course, and that is, that is it. I'm going to have to have one of those. Not now. You know, no. i got to finish my martini first. But <laughs> And then what about food? Do you have any food representation? We have a burger that is called a B-52 burger. Um, it is an uh, all-beef patty with uh, American cheese and a hot dog. And a hot dog on there. And a, and right a hot on. dog, all-beef hot dog. Uh, we also have our pilot's breakfast, which is four eggs, a choice of meat, hash browns or home fries, and toast. Wow. So, I mean, this is big food. Yes, big food. Well... Aviation is big. Yeah, well, yeah, you've got to, if you're going to keep flying, you got to have you got to fuel up. And then uh, we have our signature burger, which is a crash landing. It's two patties, American and Swiss cheese, two pieces of bacon, and uh, grilled onions and mushrooms. Wow, the crash uh, two patties. Two uh, patties. More big food. More big food. Hey, I think people like that. But I think it's interesting because that's Bob Fowler. Didn't he land here because he ran out of fuel? He did run out of fuel. Wow. Yes. And everyone, there's a statue outside here honoring him as well. It's actually a state statue. Yes. Historic statue. But I was reading about this on the back of your menu that it took it was on a 50 day journey yes from uh santa monica to miami 50 days can you imagine days. now no. now it's like a few hours yeah, right <laughs> <laughs> hey and there's a and there is an actual international airport here too uh actually yes there is um when i first moved here our airport was extremely small you we didn't have large planes you could step off of your little 12-seat propeller plane, turn around and pick up your luggage, and you were done. Wow. Yeah. Now it's a big international Yes, one. it is. There was no security checkpoints, nothing. No baggage claim. Well, Donald Trump is going to say he <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. All right, everyone, if you go to the Yuma Land or YumaLanding.com, you can read more about the history and also get the recipes for the hangar martini and all kinds of good recipes. All kinds of good recipes. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. listening to Big Blend Radio's Happy Hour Show with Nancy and Lisa, and you just heard all about the aviation history of the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill in Yuma, Arizona, and how to make a hangar martini. Plus, before that, you heard the song Whiskey by Johnny Mastro and the Mama's Boys off of their album, Never Trust the Living. Go to johnnymastro.com for all their music and albums, and also to keep up with them on their performances in New Orleans. Uh, But now, Nancy, are you ready to talk about the Craven Raven cocktail concert? So this all started with our happy hour show with the Craven Band out of West Palm Beach, who totally rock. Mm -hmm. And I think it was not, we didn't even get into saying hello to everybody. And we're like, you need a Craven Raven cocktail. And the Craven Raven cocktail contest was born. And, um, you know, we finished our segment. Actually, you can listen to their interview. If you go to blendradioandtv.com, just type in uh, Craven and you'll find them. And um, actually, the contest is all up on our site, too. Just go to bigblendradio.com for that. Um, but they decided, well, we don't just say things, we're going to do this. And uh, next thing you know, it kind of got bigger and bigger, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Just uh, prizes. Um, it's and growing. I know. So number one, all prize winners get their album on the line. And you want that album. It rocks. We're going to play some of their music in a second here. Um, but here's what's happening. So we're asking everybody to turn in their recipe for a Craven Raven cocktail. So if you go to bigblendradio.com, you can submit your recipe there. And uh, the whole prize package really, this is about going coast to coast here, from Florida to San Diego, actually, except you don't quite reach the water in San Diego. You hit the mountains and you do go to the Colorado River. You get to the ocean to ocean bridge in Yuma, Arizona. That's how you cross. Right. So this is cool. And so we say you're traveling down Old Highway 80, one of the oldest routes across country. Uh, and, and it's actually older than Route 66. It's a Craven crossing. It's the first road that went completely across the country. Um, so anyway, submit your recipe. And uh, the deadline for that is July 25th, 2018. And this is what's going to happen. Um, all the recipes are going to the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill. You just heard Heather on the on with the hangar martini, and the bartenders and mixologists over there, Heather and and the gang, are they're going to look through the recipes and say, yeah, these are feasible, 
then they're going to give us the top 10 or so. <laughs> and um, we're going to have a party on August 8th when they have their live bands and music at the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill at the Hanger Sports Bar. And we're going to taste the top and make our decision of who are the top three winners and the two runners up. While we're doing that, Ron, <laughs> he is going to run the Sarum, who is the lead guitarist of uh, the Craven Band and the only one who drinks in the band. And he likes rum, just giving everyone a heads up there. Uh, and so does Nancy. My He'll favorite. be tasting them in a bar over in Florida. And so we will be doing some crazy drunk calls to each other, Skype calls. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to be connecting that night uh, and deciding who the winner is. And the winner gets this. This is super cool. You get a two-night, three-day three stay at the Coronado Motor Hotel in Yuma, which is connected to the Yuma Landing. A historic hotel has its own museum of travel history. It's, it, this, this hotel belongs on Route 66. It should be. But it's on historic Highway 80. Anyway, so you get to have a weekend in Yuma and play on the river. Uh, they've got so much history like the Yuma Territorial Prison. Uh, it's really cool stuff. Plus, they're giving you a $25 gift certificate for the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill. And breakfast is included in your stay, by the way. So check the hotel out. Go to CoronadoMotorHotel.com. The landing, you already heard that, is YumaLanding.com. But if you want to take a day trip from Yuma out in the desert, right, you can take a nuts of like two hours, go through Anzabrego Desert State Park, the largest desert state park in the country, and get up to the little mountain town of Julian, and you'll have a $25 gift certificate to eat at Jeremy's on the Hill. Uh, it's a California-style bistro, farm-to-table, local wine, local brew. Uh, it is a very popular restaurant. So check that out at jeremysonthehill.com. Now, if you're in Florida, you can go in and use a gift certificate, a value of $110, and you're going to win a pair of Laredo number 4212 cowboy boots from J.C. Western Wear in West Palm Beach. Yeehaw. I know. I mean, we're talking some serious giftage here. Yeah, this is good. Right? So check out jcwesternwear.com. Also, while you're there, if you're the winner, you get dinner for two at Mama Gizzi's Gourmet Pasta. And I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, anyway, it's an underground supper club in Lake Worth, Florida, and that's a value Ooh. of $100. So check out mamagizipasta.com. That's M-A-M-A-G-I-Z-Z-I. MamaJizzyPasta.com, and this is a good list. You also get to win a game. It's one of the best games in the world. It's called Spontaneous. It's the song game. We played it with the Cravens, and uh, it is a song game. It is the award-winning, best-selling uh, board game on Amazon. So check it out at SongGame.com. And what you do is uh, someone gives you a word, and you got to sing out a song uh, with five lyrics, uh, five you know, five stanza. A stanza, a stanza using yeah. that word. So, Nancy, if I said wine, what would you what would you come up with? The days of wine and roses. There you go. See, and you don't have to really sing, just like. Well, you know. I could if you want, but it's okay. I haven't had a drink yet. Yeah, we've got the Cravens for that. <laughs> uh, and then the Cravens, of course, you get a T-shirt from them. Uh, their new album on the line, and they're giving you a hundred dollar gift card, plus the book. A Short History of Drunk Drunkness by Mark Forsyth. And that's fun. So isn't this amazing? That's yes. the first prize. Again, everything is up on BigBlendRadio.com. Second prize winner gets a Cravens t-shirt, their album on the line, a $50 gift card. And, and also go to the band website, CravenSongs.com. You also get the book, A Short History of Drunkenness by Mark Forsyth. And then the third prize is the Cravens t-shirt, their album on the line, a $25 gift certificate plus the book, A Short History of Drunkenness. And then we're going to have two runners up because, you know, when everyone's having a cocktail and smiling, everyone should win something, right? So we'll have two honorable mentions. You'll get a Craven's, uh, Craven, I'm calling them the Craven Raven Band now, <laughs> the Craven's uh, T-shirt and album. So again, everyone, uh, go to BigBlendRadio.com to enter and make sure you get those recipes in by July 25th, 2018. And also the winner, We'll have your recipe published in the September-October issue of Big Blend Radio and TV magazine and on our website, blendradioandtv.com. And I think we're going to have a follow-up happy hour with the Craven Band and the winner. Oh, that's going to be fun. So we're going to have to have a party. Maybe we'll have, we'll have, maybe have the have second and the third. Drink. We'll see whatever, whatever we can do to have a party. We will. Uh, so keep keep touch with that. Just go to bigblendradio.com. And we want to give a big thank you to Springfield Tourism Commission 
for sponsoring the show, Springfield, Kentucky, where we're going to be this fall. And uh, they are on the bourbon route. They are in central Kentucky, which is known as the land of bourbon, horses, and history. So go to the website, visit SpringfieldKY.com. All right, so we're going to close up with some music. Don't forget Big Blend Radio airs Monday through Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Fridays and Sundays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Of course, the schedule to listen live or on demand is all at BigBlendRadio.com. I think I've said that 20 times today. Mm -hmm. uh, but here it is. We're going to close with one of our favorite songs from the Cravens off of their new album, On the Line. Here it is, Road to Reason. Take care, everybody. Yeah.